Okay, um, as our next speaker, we're very t happy to have um, Andrew Geraci, um, and he'll be telling us about um, experimental tests of novel short-range forces with AMO methods. Okay, well, I'd like to thank the organizers very much for inviting me to speak at this really exciting workshop. I really enjoyed a lot of exciting discussions both today and on the previous two days and hope to have some more uh, later on this afternoon as well. So I'm going to say a little bit about the uh, experiments that we're involved with using AMO methods to look for new physics, in particular uh, looking for uh, some short-range new forces. And um, I'm going to say a bit about the uh, work we're doing now on an experiment to test gravity at short distance, possibly maybe uncovering something related to quantum gravity, depending how you interpret it. And then I'll talk about how the same technology we're using there can also be used for uh, gravitational wave uh, experiments. And in the second half of the, the talk, I'll shift gears to uh, uh, looking, uh, talking about our experiments looking for ultralight dark matter, including both scalars and axions. So if you look at the standard model of particle physics, we have this huge disparity in energy scales. So for example, the gravitational force between two protons in a nucleus is about 36 orders of magnitude smaller than their electromagnetic repulsion. And so this, this hierarchy problem has plagued uh, uh, particle physicists for quite some time now uh, to try to explain this apparent desert where there's no known physics between the electroweak scale and the inferred energy scale of quantum gravity at 10 to the 19 GeV or so. And so one solution is, of course, supersymmetry, which is still being uh, searched for at, at the Large Hadron Collider. Uh, other ideas have been proposed, for example, perhaps that uh, there are large extra dimensions in space where this uh, high scale of gravity is really just an illusion and the true fundamental scale of gravity might be actually much closer to the uh, electroweak scale where gravity would basically just look diluted because it it's propagating out into extra dimensions. So either of these models, whether you have supersymmetry or large dimensions, uh, can suggest signatures that um, the gravitational Newtonian force law may, may change its character below some characteristic length scale. And a theoretical length scale that seems to come up uh, naturally here is sort of the sub-millimeter range. And so in this case, you can look to see whether there be some new exponential form or perhaps a power law change in the gravitational interaction when you bring two masses together at a really close distance. And so uh, you can look at sort of the landscape uh, for tests of this sort of correction to the Newtonian potential. So this is the 1 over R uh, familiar form of the potential with the addition of an extra Yukawa type correction, which could be produced due to some of this new new physics. And what I'm showing here are the current, the current landscape for experimental constraints on, on this sort of a correction. So here we're going all the way from laboratory scales down below micron up to astrophysical kind of planetary scales on the x-axis. And then on the, on the y-axis, we have some coupling parameter, which basically describes the strength of this interaction relative to gravity. So if alpha was 1, that would be something of gravitational strength. And as you can see from the graph here, if we look at sort of Earth-Moon distances, uh, we have these precise uh, loser, lunar laser ranging experiments, which really tell us that the 1 over R form of the potential is holding to better than a part in a billion uh, level. Uh, but, but notice the contrast if you go down to below micron uh, here on the, all the way on the left edge, you could actually have an interaction here that would be uh, 10 billion times the strength of gravity, but experimentally there would be no, uh, there'd be no constraint on, on such, a, such a new force. And so this is difficult because if you just look at uh, how the gravitational uh, force uh, scales, uh, for example, if I have two uh, test masses that are uh, say spherical and, and have a certain radius, and I bring them as close together as possible, you can figure out that the Newtonian force between the masses is going like the positive uh, fourth power of the size scale here. And so if I shrink this system down, uh, this, th these forces get very weak very rapidly. And so for material that is about as dense as one can discover on Earth, uh, around 20 grams per cubic centimeter, at, at the range of theoretical interest, say 10 microns, the, the magnitude of this force you're trying to measure is about 10 to the minus 21 uh, newtons, which is, uh, you know, quite, quite tiny. Um, <clears throat> at the same time, you have to be worried with the fact that uh, other, th other standard model forces are actually much stronger than gravity, as we've already pointed out. And so there are many electromagnetic background forces that make these type of gravitational tests at short distance particularly challenging. In particular, there's the Casimir effect, which is an interesting effect in and of itself. If you just have uh, nearby surfaces, you can have uh, flux back and fluctuations, uh, which can cause attractive forces between metallic surfaces, for example. 
And we also have the possibility of, uh, of kind of dirt force effects where you have things like electrostatic patch potentials or even though conductors are supposed to be perfect conductors, in fact, they have local potential variations and these can produce spurious uh, type electromagnetic signals uh, in those experiments. So if I zoom in on kind of the laboratory end now of that uh, parameter space here, now going from about 100 microns down to about 10 nanometers, the area here in yellow is what has been uh, ruled out uh, by different experiments. And the area on the left in pink and green are some of the predictions from some of the theories that, that I mentioned. Uh, so at the longest length scales here, the best constraints are from precision uh, torsion balance experiments that are uh, done at the University of Washington. At, at slightly shorter distances, there are micro cantilever experiments uh, that uh, I was involved in for some of my PhD research uh, at sort of a 10 micron length scale. And then at even smaller scales, the best measurements come from sort of ad adaptations of measurements that are designed to look at Casimir effects. Uh, so all of these, all of these experiments, uh, you know, are plagued with the same problem. They need really high sensitivity, and they also have these background uh, signals to contend with. And they're all based on sort of some sort of mechanical uh, force sensing device, whether it's a cantilever or a torsion fiber or a torsion uh, um, pendulum or something along this. And these mechanical sensors are, are limited uh, from one funda fundamental uh, mechanism, which is just thermal noise. And so, so in, in particular, if you have a, a oscillator in contact with some thermal bath at some finite temperature, you can just write down the acquisition theorem and figure out that in the presence of sort of random thermal kicks from the thermal energy of the bath, there's a minimum force that one can uh, resolve in the presence of those random kicks. And it, it goes like the thermal energy KT uh, times the spring constant of the oscillator uh, uh, times the bandwidth of the measurement uh, times the product of the mechanical quality factor and the frequency of the oscillator. So um, one approach then to improve the sensitivity is to improve the mechanical quality factor or eliminate dissipation in the system. And these type of sensors, whether they're torsion fibers or cantilevers, tend to have different mechanisms for, for mechanical loss, including clamping mechanisms, as well as surface imperfections and just heat transfer of flow in materials, for example, from thermoelastic dissipation while, the, while, the, while these materials flex. And so, so this limitation can actually be overcome uh, using techniques from the atomic uh, physics community, where we actually can use radiation pressure from light to, to suspend a mechanical oscillator rather than having a clamped sort of solid state system. And so here, if we have a dielectric object uh, and, and shine a laser at it, it, it requires a uh, dipole moment induced from the light. And one can get a potential where there'll be a minimum of energy at, at the focus of a laser where, where a particle will be attracted to, to um, a bright spot, if you like, in, in the light field and have a sort of confinement around that, around that point. So now if you were to observe the motion of this particle, uh, now its, its motion is very well decoupled from the environment. There's no more clamping mechanism or or I'm not as concerned about the materials properties of the particle itself because I'm just looking at how the center mass of this thing uh, oscillates around in my container essentially made of light uh, in this case. And so in this way, we can really improve the, the mechanical quality factor and get uh, very good uh, force sensitivity. So in our, in our group, we, we trap nanoparticles that are silica uh, glass spheres in, in uh, standing wave optical traps in high vacuum. And this is some of our earlier uh, force demonstration, sensitivity demonstration, where we were able to uh, show that these systems actually can, can conduct calibrated uh, force sensing measurements at the level of a few zepto newtons. So zepto is 10 to the minus 21 newtons. Uh, for those of you not familiar, and this is actually right at the level where I was saying, claiming at the beginning that, that these interesting gravitational signals might start to, to surface. And so um, in our experiment, uh, then the, the, what we're doing is setting up a, a nanoparticle next to a conducting a mirror surface. And then behind the mirror surface, we have a, a drive mass device that has different density materials in it, in our case, gold and silicon. Uh, we move that. Uh, driving mass device, and when we do that, we modulate the gravitational signal on the nanoparticle. The, the conducting mirror in between is there to screen out the electromagnetic and Casimir background forces uh, that should not vary as I move the mass around behind the screen. And so using this system, both with its really good sensitivity and with the ability to position a particle really close to the surface here using uh, the fact that we can put it in a number of antinodes of, or bright spots of the standing wave in this, in this optical cavity, uh, one can expect to do many orders of magnitude improvement uh, on previous limits and start to search into some of this other interesting theoretical parameter space at the length scale of a micron or so. And uh, so I also want to mention there's some similar experiments that are 
based on different ge geometry approaches also being developed at, at, by groups at, at Stanford and Yale that are looking for similar things, but at a little bit bigger, bigger length scales. So in our experiment, uh, we, we collect a 300 nanometer diameter silica glass particle. This is the test mass. Uh, we hold it in a uh, laser trap and then we can laser cool the motion, the center of mass motion using laser feedback cooling and then confine it in this standing wave trap where the particle is uh, next to our conducting mirror and behind the connecting mirror we have a actuator device that uh, moves this uh, driving mass, uh, sorry, up and down uh, to, to modulate the gravitational signal. So this is a picture of kind of the guts of the drive mass in the middle of its fabrication process. We have this silicon wafer, uh, so we're using semiconductor processing technology to basically create this density modulation of gold and silicon by etching some teeth into a silicon wafer, filling them up with gold, and then kind of smoothing the surface down at the end to create this buried uh, density modulation on, on the device. So, um, so it's not only sufficient to have the sensitivity, but we also have to be able to place this nanoparticle very close to the uh, conducting mirror, in particular, micron scale distances to really, uh, you know, be sensitive to forces that exponentially die off at the micron length scale. And so the way we load the particles near the surface is using a retroreflected optical lattice. So here's a demonstration of one method that we've developed to, to do that. So where here you have a nanoparticle that's initially held in, a, in an optical uh, uh, focus trap here. We, we um, can in, insert a mirror membrane into the, into the trap and then transfer the particle into a antinode of that trap which is close to the mirror surface. So when we do that then you can see how the spectrum of the particle changes where we have a much tighter confinement in the in the axial direction compared to the uh, initial trap which which shows that uh, you know in fact we we're now seeing the lattice optical lattice structure of this trapping potential. In this case the the particle is 408 nanometers away from the, the surface which is the first uh, antinode of the, of the trapping uh, potential. And so once the particle is there, now we've demonstrated that you can actually scan the particle around in the plane uh, parallel to that surface and also adjust the distance uh, to the surface at the sort of micron range. So this is a demonstration now that's sort of a, just a proof of principle that one can do this type of scanning for sensing at the atonewton uh, level. Uh, and you can sort of scan the, the plane, you know, at various points here along, along the um, Thing, which is really useful because now we can characterize some of these spurious background signals like uh, electromagnetic patch potentials and other things that may have some sort of distance dependence profile uh, along, along the surface. So this will be a useful tool in, in, our, in our test. And then ultimately when we put the um, laser cooling back that we've previously been using, in principle we should be able to get all the way down back to the septo-newton level uh, sensitivity for the ultimate measurement so we're excited to now put these put all these pieces together and hopefully sometime soon uh, have some new uh, results on tests of gravity at the micron or so length scale um, but I wanted to mention sort of more uh, some more upcoming and more speculative things that we're also excited about uh, developing here in particular uh, we're looking at whether you can use these these nanoparticles actually as a detector for gravitational waves trying to take advantage of this zepto Newton kind of force sensitivity you know, in terms of uh, applications such as this and this I think is a really exciting time and we've already heard several talks about some of the really interesting physics that we've already learned from gravitational waves and some of the stuff that we still are yet to learn and in particular uh, I want to kind of amplify one of the comments that Hartman made before I mean we can think about gravitational wave detectors as sort of a, a tool if you want for probing the dark sector or, or dark matter and, and the, the application that we're looking at in particular would be to use these levitated particles to look for dark matter candidates like axions uh, or, or perhaps other sources uh, of a signal that, for example, being primordial black holes uh, in, that are sort of sub-solar mass uh, range. So already there's uh, some work from the LIGO group on some constraints on primordial uh, black hole dark matter, and we think that uh, these levitated sensors can really say something to the story here, potentially here uh, as well. So here's the basic principle, of, if you want, for how that um, how that measurement would work. So you can kind of think about this as sort of an optical version of the old style uh, Joe Weber type uh, aluminum bar detector. So in that, in that case you have a gravitational wave coming along and, and striking the detector and causing it to ring like a bell and then you observe you know, the strain uh, caused on that, on that object. So in, in this case we imagine we trap a, a particle, a dielectric particle inside of an optical cavity and think of now a cavity that's much smaller than the cavities of LIGO, so say ranging from meter scale up to maybe 100 meters 
And now the gravitational wave will, will, will essentially uh, change the physical distance between the end mirrors of the cavity. And then when that happens, the, the trapping potential, the, the, the antinode where the particle is sitting will get displaced. And then the particle will get kicked as a result of that uh, displacement. And so, so you can uh, arrange it so that the, uh, the resonance frequency of the trap, of the particle in the trap, coincides with the frequency of a passing gravitational wave. So in this way, it's sort of like a tunable resonant version of uh, the bar detector. And when that happens, then the particle will get rung up into a large oscillation. And so you can get quite, uh, quite good strain sensitivity activities at high frequency uh, with this kind of approach. And so this type of approach wouldn't be competitive, say, for example, with the LIGO detectors at their frequency band, but it would rather extend the frequency range of LIGO detectors into higher, higher ranges. And the reason is that um, while LIGO is limited at high frequency by laser shot noise, in this case, we're limited by that thermal uh, Brownian motion that I talked about. And those two noise sources have a different frequency scaling. So uh, whereas LIGO sensitivity is actually getting worse at high frequency, this technique actually gets better at high frequency. So there's sort of a crossover point, if you want. So we're building now a one meter Michelson a prototype of this to sort of test the, the noise levels and to a proof of concept. But so the basic idea is then we have these two arms of the Michelson and under a space-time uh, disturbance, we'll expect to see a particular pattern of displacement of the two systems suspended particles in each arm's uh, inter arm of the cavity. So um, the signals that we could look for, I mentioned already primordial black holes. The other signal I think that's really interesting, it would be signals from axon annihilations uh, through uh, uh, black holes uh, within our galaxy. So if you have black, hole, black holes, you can accumulate uh, clouds of axions through the super radiance process. And then these axions can annihilate with themselves being their own antiparticle. And so now you can get a monochromatic source of gravitational radiation where basically the gravitational wave is twice the mass of the axion. And so for say gut scale axions, this, this is sort of right at the range of 100 kilohertz frequencies, which is nicely you know, in, the, in the range of our optimum sensitivity band. And so we could in principle um, look for these kind of axion uh, signals uh, with it using this instrument of different, different um, sizes here and using different sort of levitated sensors for these different curves that we're showing. And so then the vision would really be to sort of, this is now uh, very similar to some of the plots we saw earlier and I should probably uh, add the interesting uh, atom interferometer uh, uh, ideas and other ideas to this uh, plot to extend, fill in some of the gaps at low frequency. But what we're, we're hoping to do here is actually fill in some of the gaps at the higher frequency end. And so using these levitated sensors, then we, we expect to be able to cover uh, these dark matter related uh, sources at, at sort of above the 10 kilohertz band uh, in, in, in instruments of various uh, sizes as, as we develop the technology. Okay, so um, I just, just want to briefly mention, so all of these applications are all sort of in the classical limit, right? So we're thinking about, uh, you know, just a particle in a trap and we're thermal noise limited and we're not really in the quantum regime necessarily of measurement in these cases. But uh, in fact, it's possible to, to now get these particles into the quantum regime. This is something that's happened long ago now for individual atoms and ions. And as of about a decade ago, even larger mechanical objects using cryogenic techniques and other laser cooling techniques have now been able to actually be cooled into the mechanical ground state of some vibrational mode. And so back in, 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 this is sort of showing the rapid progress in the field over the past decades. But uh, in 2019 now, this has been proven also to be possible for uh, uh, levitated particles by Marcus Asmar's group in Vienna. So this opens up some exciting possibilities, I think, for experiments for using ultra cold particles, in particular for uh, matter wave interference type experiments. And so, uh, so the largest objects now that have been demonstrated uh, to show matter wave interference are these large molecules that are shown in some exciting work from Marcus Arndt's group. It should be possible to extend the size scale of these things by a few orders of magnitude to these glass nanospheres. And if you do that, there are many interesting applications. In particular, you could uh, perhaps get even better sensitivity using interferometry experiments for these short uh, distance uh, type force tests. And then also uh, there's, there are interesting prospects for preparing quantum superpositions now of these ultra cold particles, in particular going towards questions about what being able to see what role exactly gravity plays in entangling quantum systems. I won't say much about this because I'll direct you to Anya Pam's talk who's going to say about, a lot more about this I think in detail uh, shortly. Okay, so let me just now switch gears for the last uh, 10 minutes or so and talk about some of the other activities that we're excited about um, where we're looking for dark matter, either scalar dark matter or, 
or dark matter candidates like axions. And in particular, um, one of the efforts we're building up is similar to one of the efforts that, that Hartman also mentioned this morning, where we're looking for really light scalar dark matter. So we have this kind of natural division of whether dark matter should be thought of as a particle uh, or a wave sort of with the boundary uh, given sort of at the one EV or so level. Dark matter could be if it's a wave, you know, all the way as light as 10 to the minus 22 EV and still fit inside of the uh, dwarf galaxies. So um, in particular, uh, if you have this ultralight scalar field background, uh, it has some energy density uh, or has some amplitude that's related to the energy density in dark matter, uh, rho dark matter, and then it has some frequency that's the Compton frequency of the dark matter field, which could be anywhere in this range all the way down to um, uh, 10 to the minus 8 hertz or so, which is corresponding to this 10 to the minus 22 uh, EV level. And so in particular, this can cause fluctuations, as it's been pointed out in different parameters in the standard model, for example, the mass of the electron or the fine structure constant. If you have an oscillating electron mass, then you have an oscillating Bohr radius of the atom. And so if I have a rigid object, like an optical cavity, then the size of the optical cavity will actually breathe or strain as that uh, mass of the electron fluctuates with as it interacts with the passing uh, dark matter field. And so we're doing an experiment now to try to, to measure this using a comparison of cryogenic optical cavities. So the idea is you have a one rigid cavity with a, with a solid spacer, which is going to be undergoing this breathing effect as the dark matter interacts with it. And we compare the length of that against a suspended cavity, which is not able to respond quickly enough to respond to that passing dark matter uh, a field as it, as it shakes the ceiling above it or strains the, the ceiling above it. And so this uh, should have enough sensitivity to get into this kind of theoretically interesting natural ranges for these uh, these parameters for modulations of the, for example, electron mass in a tabletop size uh, cavity type experiment. And there's also some exciting work from other experiments that are also showing some constraints now in different parts of frequency space, as well as the work that um, uh, Hardwood mentioned from the uh, GEO uh, experiment that we heard about earlier this morning. Geo 600. Um, and then finally, uh, one, one exciting thing I wanted to talk about um, the, in, more in the realm of new short range fifth forces is uh, we're doing an experiment to look for uh, not mass coupled, but rather spin coupled uh, forces in particular from, from the QCD axion. And so there are a number of experiments that are looking for the axion or axion like particles as dark matter candidates. We want to exploit the fact that um, axions are actually a force mediator, which can cause uh, in interactions with, between spins and, and uh, uh, nuclei at, di at distances as small as, as 30 microns. The, the nice thing about this is that we don't need to make an assumption about dark matter or the amplitude of the, the local axion background field in, in, at Earth. We can just try to see directly as whether the axion exists as a, as a force mediator. And so our experiment is the Axion Resonant Interaction Detection Experiment, or Ariadne for short. It's a collaboration between folks at these uh, institutions. And so uh, in terms of the parameter space for the QC Axion, it's kind of a nice theoretical target because it has sort of only has one parameter. The mass is related to the uh, the, the K constant uh, for the QCD axion. And so you can really look at describing the parameter space just in terms of the mass of the axion. So there's a number of current experiments that are running uh, to, to search uh, for, for axions. We know from astrophysical uh, limits, the axion's lighter than about 10 milliEV. And then depending on the model of cosmology, the axion could be uh, uh, also be lighter than uh, 10 micro, or the micro EV level. And so there's sort of a range between kind of nano or Pico EV up to milli EV, which is really the allowed window for, for axions. And so uh, this is sort of a blow up of some of the recent really exciting work kind of filling in the micro EV range. Uh, what, there have been a number of proposals and experiments that are developing now to kind of fill in some gaps here on the lower end. Our experiment is trying to fill in the gap here on the upper end, kind of looking for axions from several uh, micro EV up to several milli EV. And the way we do it is looking again for this fifth force. So this is like my original cartoon where I had two masses, except now one is a mass and the other is a nuclear spin. And so uh, the axion will mediate a potential that looks uh, like this form. It's called the monopole dipole term, where you have a sigma dot r coupling between the spin of one fermion and the mass of another. And we have these coupling constants. One is a scalar coupling, one is a, a pseudo scalar coupling. And then there's this one over r squared type uh, dependence because it couples to the spin and the spin is proportional to the magnetic moment, 
we can think about this as sort of a fictitious magnetic field, if you want, which is acting on the spin, that only turns on when the mass is brought within the Compton wavelength of the axion. So lambda axion is fed by the mass of the axion. Um, and so uh, <clears throat> in this case, uh, this is different than a regular magnetic field that doesn't couple to angular momentum or moving charges and, and doesn't obey Maxwell's equations. Uh, for the experiment, uh, it's important that it is not screened uh, by magnetic shielding so that we can block ordinary magnetic noise, but, but let this uh, interaction uh, persist. And so the mass of the axion uh, is less than, say, about 6 milliEV, so that gives you the length scale here. You're, you want to get your objects together at sort of 30, 30 microns or larger to look for lighter axions. And so the principle of detection we're using is NMR. Basically, you take the nuclear spin. In our case, it's a helium-3 nucleus, spin one half. You put it in an external field, and now there's some energy level splitting between uh, spin up and down. That's basically given by the nuclear Lamar precession frequency. And now we use a resonant technique where we take a mass and we bring it closer and farther away from the spin, but at the resonance frequency, at the nuclear Lamar precession frequency. And so when we do that, then we will drive, uh, you, the axion potential will actually drive the spin precession. So it's sort of acting like a transverse uh, excitation field here in NMR, and it's driving that precession, and then we can pick up that precessing spin uh, using a squid magnetometer and take advantage of the fact that there's a really high Q here, and here the high Q is from the, the large uh, T2 time or transverse decoherence time of, uh, of uh, helium-3 uh, nucleus. And so this gives us a nice handle to get a big resonant enhancement that gives us a large field that can be picked up, for example, with a squid uh, magnetometer. So the experiment uh, is still in cartoon form, but it looks a little bit more like this. In fact, uh, what we have to modulate the axion potential is a mass that's shaped as uh, like gear, a gear with teeth in it. And so as the different teeth pass by, then we turn on and off essentially this axion potential uh, at the period of the nuclear alarm position frequency. And so then when we do that, then the, the passing teeth of my of my unpolarized uh, tungsten uh, wheel here are the, is the device that's then driving the spin precession. So we use laser polarized helium uh, to get a high polarization, and then we have a, a squid uh, pickup loop to measure the magnetic field in the system. Fundamentally, we expect to be limited by the quantum uh, spin projection noise uh, in the sample. And so this is more uh, getting a little more realistic now, looking at the design for the, the bottom uh, cryostat plate where we have uh, a tungsten source mass 11, with 11 segments. We're measuring at a frequency of about 100 uh, hertz, which is something that we can tune depending on how fast we spin and what a field uh, we apply. And separation distances here on the order of a couple hundred microns for this first uh, round of the experiment. Here's a picture of the prototype uh, tungsten source mass, which is about four centimeters across. So then using the system, this is what we're trying to uh, achieve as our goal for searching for the axion. So this is now the parameter space uh, with the mass of the axion at the top going from milliEV down to microEV, uh, and then equivalently the force range on the bottom from uh, this 30 microns up to about 10 centimeters, and then the product of these two couplings on the y-axis. Current experimental limits are in this shaded blue range. Uh, if you add in some astrophysical uh, constraints combining them with the experiment, you get this shaded uh, tan area. But the QCD axion, if you ask where it's expected to be, is actually in this darker band here at the, at the bottom. The upper edge of the band is because we have a limit on the neutron EDM. We know theta QCD is less than about 10 to the minus 10. There's a lower band here because we know there's some CP violation already in the standard model, and so we would expect theta QCD to be bigger than about 10 to the minus 16. And so we're aiming somewhere in this range. We think in the first round of our initial experiment, we hope to be able to get now to probe really into that uh, parameter space, uh, depending on what kind of T2 time we can actually achieve in the, in the lab. And then in a future experiment, if we scale things up, we're projecting we should be able to take out about half of that parameter space uh, on this log scale. Uh, if you look at the sensitivity just limited by the magnetometer, by the squid, that, then it would, in principle, allow you to carve out almost the entire parameter space. So using other techniques where we take advantage of quantum coherence in, in the long-term future, uh, or spin squeezing or something like that, might even be able to let us push down all the way to that limit in the, in the, in the far future. So um, with that, I think I'll just wrap up. So I talked about a number of different AMO methods that we're developing to look for new physics beyond the standard model, including gravity, gravitational waves, uh, testing different aspects of quantum uh, mechanics, as well as searches for dark matter candidates like axions or other 
uh, wave like dark matter and I wanted to um, just acknowledge some of the people doing actually all the hard work and then uh, thank our funding and thanks for your attention. Um, thank you very much for the very nice talk um, and I'll open it up to questions for Andrew. Yeah, uh, Ted? Thanks, yeah, very interesting. I have a question about the gravitational wave detector scheme. Okay. I guess I would think the laser intensity would have to be high like it is in LIGO, but then all that energy would impinge on the glass bead and heat it up, so is that an issue? Yeah, so um, it's a great question. So actually, uh, one of the technical limitations of these optical levitation experiments is actually associated with laser heating and absorption in the particle itself. And so you want to use materials that have a very low imaginary index so that they um, actually don't absorb as much, very much heat from the, from the, from the uh, laser. So what this effectively does is make some sort of upper bound on the frequency that you can achieve in these experiments. So if, if, if you go above a certain laser intensity, you will start to um, lose the particle or evaporate it even if, if it's sufficiently high. But, but for reasonable parameters of materials, we think probably up to 300 kilohertz is pretty reasonable in terms of damage on the, on the actual material. There may be ways of getting um, even higher frequencies if you use special materials that are doped with uh, crystals that you can actually internally cool. So there's sort of solid state laser coolable materials, which may allow you in theory to get even higher uh, intensities if you use particular wavelengths and particular materials for the levitated object. But just using kind of silica, really pure silica glass, um, it should be possible to get to a few hundred kilohertz before you start to really limit it, get limited from that. Was that your question or was there some other? I think that's it, yeah, thank you. Okay. All right, Mariana. Thank you for a great talk. Can you go a little bit more over the which sources your um, novel gravitational wave detector would be sensitive for? I missed the point about why would the action annihilation source gravitational wave? Yeah, so this is a good question. Thanks. I, I went over this kind of quickly. So, so I think one of the most interesting things we are looking for here with this detector is actually axion annihilations. And so, so if you look at the Milky Way, you know, up to say a distance of maybe 10 kiloparsecs, we estimate something like maybe 10 to the 7, 10 to the 8 black holes within the Milky Way. And so these are, you know, fairly close by. Uh, if the axion exists, there's a process uh, known as the Penrose superradiance process, where if you ha there's a way of extracting energy out of spinning black holes and, if, and forming clouds of black holes that are, can be quite long-lived uh, around, uh, sorry, clouds of axions, sorry, around these local black holes that can be quite long-lived. The axion, uh, it's sort of, you can think about it sort of like a gravitational atom, if you want, in the sky, where you have, you could have level transitions be between the bound axions, but you can also have annihilations between the axions that are in that cloud. And the, the, if you have axions that annihilate, then they can produce a single graviton with, a, with a, a frequency that's equal to twice the mass of the axion. And so um, that frequency for a gut scale axion is about 100 kilohertz or so, which is kind of in this range where, where we're, you know, would be sensitive. So I'm still puzzled over that. Why don't you just produce photons? Why do you produce gravitons? Yeah, I mean, I guess there's some process, right, where you can produce other, other <laughs> signals as well, but this is just based on an estimate of the graviton emission mm -hmm. from, from this case. Okay. And so, so you have some energy, you know, momentum conservation conditions, right, and you have the fact that you're around the black hole allows for this process to happen mm -hmm. in a certain way with certain um, rate so predictions and so forth. There have also been some predictions that uh, gravitational, um, just black hole mergers, would actually produce ultralight fields. Would you be sensitive to something like this? Yeah, this is a great question. Yeah, I, I actually, I, I have to do, I think, more analysis, really. I've been excited about that idea, and I haven't had the opportunity to really analyze it in detail. But in principle, it would be interesting to see if there would be some kind of a signature here from that as well. I think with this high frequency detector, uh, one thing also that I didn't mention is that when you do have these mergers, uh, you know, we have fairly high sensitivity at the high frequency end. And so in principle, we can also see kind of high frequency tails and harmonics and things like that of those type of mergers that might not be as, you know, 
visible in the larger interferometer kind of detectors. Is there any reason you can actually, uh, there wouldn't be any reason why you would see a uh, signal background gravitation wave from inflation at high frequencies? I think it's very small. Yeah, okay. I, I, so I'm not aware of, okay. yeah, I mean, I think at this frequency, the, at least the models I've looked at and I'm familiar with, uh, I don't think there's too much prospect, although there are certain kind of blue shifted models. I'm not sure if maybe other folks, um, there was this workshop that Hartman had mentioned uh, where there's a, a paper that came out of that, a white paper looking at some possible sources. But my impression was that, that this was, the axion signal is probably the lowest lying target here sure. in this range. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks so much. Um, Ana Maria. Ah, great, thanks. A very nice talk, Andrew. So I have Thanks. one question related to the spin-dependent force when you put the mass. Is there any concern with magnetic dipole-dipole interactions or some type of other type of interactions that approach, as you approach um, dipole-mediated or magnetic dipole? Yeah, so actually there, there's an analogous potential term actually that where you'd actually would, would have a real dipole-dipole interaction even mediated by the axion. Uh, so the, the the challenge there, uh, you know, is that uh, sorry, I'm got too many things to click through. The challenge there is that now, if you really have two magnetic or you know two spin polarized objects, you have the real magnetic signal associated with the spin polarized object. I mean, there are tricks people have done of making objects with you know with a lot of spin and not much actual magnetization. You know, if you arrange things in a clever way, so you can kind of suppress the real magnetic field at some level. But, but the challenge in doing the spin-spin experiment is that oftentimes you have to contend with the real magnetic background much larger than you would have in the case of an unpolarized uh, object interacting with the polarized spin. In our case, we're extremely sensitive to regular background magnetic field fluctuations from uh, noise at, at our frequency range of interest and from a number of different sources, um, including things like, uh, you know, magnetic impurities uh, and, and um, other other kinds of effects, and so so um, in in this case, uh, you know the, the 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 challenge. One of the big challenges here. I didn't talk about the technical details so much in this experiment. One of the big challenges is really to get a really pristine environment around the the spin, and, that, and the, the way we do that is using a superconducting uh, shielding enclosure to eliminate some of these uh, magnetic backgrounds. Thanks. Sorry, um, Ted, did you still have questions or comments, or is that hand from before? Okay. Um, are there any more comments slash questions for Andrew? Um, um, I actually had um, something I was curious about. So when you talked about detecting um, forces at very short distances, what, what kind of um, scales did you go down to? Yeah, so we're looking primarily at kind of the micron length scale, so sort of one micron. So our object uh, in our trap, oh, I think I went I go too far now. The object is, is about 400 nanometers away from the metal surface in our case here. Um, the, and then the surface itself is a few hundred nanometers thick. So we're kind of talking mass separation distances at the micron, at the micron range. Uh, and then in terms of projected sensitivity, uh, something like here, right? For say between 100 nanometers up to 10 microns, we should be able to make some kind of uh, uh, improved search, I think. And are you looking for something specific? Like, do you have to rule out backgrounds from known forces and stuff like that? Yeah, that's actually really the name of the game with these measurements. It's not only about getting the sensitivity, but it's about understanding what it is you're looking at that, that's on top of the, the signal. So the, the big, the Casimir effect, for example, is about 10 to the five times stronger than what we're trying to measure. And the way we deal with it is by rendering it sort of a DC background that doesn't vary when I move my mass pattern, you know, behind the mirror, if, if you like. There are other things like spurious patch potentials and things that can cause uh, surface, you know, interactions between the nanoparticle and the, and the surface. And so as a way of characterizing that, there's different tricks that we use. So for example, if we, if we change the location where that, that, uh, that oscillating mass is moving behind the mirror, if we, if we say vary the equilibrium position of that oscillation, we would expect to see a particular pattern in the force if it's really due to the density modulation, where it would kind of get strong and weak and strong and weak again, depending on whether the, the heavier gold piece is next to the nanoparticle or the lighter 
silicon piece is next to the nanoparticle. And so that's one thing where we can kind of scan what's going on behind the surface to kind of tease out those effects. The other effect is the uh, approach that I showed you where, where we just demonstrated this scanning method where you can actually move the particle kind of over the surface and kind of map out the local uh, area in terms of how quiet it is in, these, in terms of these, uh, you know, patch signals and other kind of backgrounds with uh, trap dipoles and things like that. Okay. Um... Okay, um, so uh, thank you, Andrew, again, and uh, we'll move on to the next talk. Um